it's really a true honor for me to be asked to deliver this lecture, um, which marks the memory of a great judge who was bestowed by the legal gods with the rarest of talents, um, that of Elegantia Juris. And his elegant and beautifully written judgments reflect legal erudition and a, sublime, a sublime prose style. And um, no better proof of that is by consulting the appeal cases of the late 40s and the Northern Irish reports of the 50s and the 60s and early 70s. Um, uh, and thus, I'm deeply honoured to deliver this lecture in his memory. And I'm delighted to note, and again, truly humbled by the fact that um, two members of his family, along with his grandchildren, um, Sir John and Do Dr. Edith Cunningham, are present and have honoured me in this way, and I, I would like to mark that. Um, before I start the lecture, I just want to say one or two other words, if I may. Um, I'd like to note two members of the Queen's faculty who have made a profound and notable contribution to the constitutional law of my own jurisdiction. Um, Professor Chris McCrudden, um, uh, humbles, I'm humbled and amazed by his insights into the drafting uh, of the 1937 Constitution, something which I'm supposed to know something, but when I meet Chris, I'm afraid uh, I find out the limits of my knowledge, and I'm just amazed by his insight and erudition. I'd also like to note um, the contribution of Prof uh, Professor Bryce Dixon. Uh, he has written what can only be described as a masterpiece of a book on the Irish Supreme Court published by Oxford uh, University Press in 2019. And it's one of the great, great contributions uh, to nonfiction uh, concerning uh, effectively the, uh, the, the law and politics of the Republic of Ireland. And um, in this time and in this place, I'd also like to just know two other individuals. Uh, one other great legal titan uh, has sadly passed away, um, Lord Kerr, who passed um, prematurely on the 1st of December uh, 2020. Um, a, a, another great legal titan from, from Northern Ireland. Uh, and I think it's fitting that in this time and in this place uh, that his memory is cherished and remembered. And I would also like to note um, uh, and I often think of him, um, the late Edgar Graham, who was so cruelly murdered in December 1983, um, a distinguished member of the Queen's law faculty. And I would like in my own modest way, if I may, uh, and I hope the McDermott family won't, won't mind, uh, if in addition to marking the memory of their father, um, I would also like this um, lecture to mark in its own modest way, um, Lord Kerr and Edgar Graham. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to, I've been asked to speak on the topic of should judges be neutral? And in doing that, I'm going to uh, have a, it's a pity that I can't be there in person. Um, and I'm sure Judge Schaefer Leary next year, one hopes will be able to deliver this lecture uh, in person. So I have prepared a, a PowerPoint presentation ranging to about 27 slides, and we'll try and get through this as crisply uh, as we can. Now, um, I was struck, if we could start with the first of the slides, please. I was struck by um, comments made by two recently appointed U.S. Supreme Court judges. Amy Coney Barrett said on taking her oath of office that the most important feature of judicial independence was independence from its own personal views. And Judge Neil Gorsuch here on the right uh, said at his confirmation hearing, he said, I've decided cases for North Americans seeking to protect tribal land for victims of nuclear waste pollution and so on. And sometimes I've ruled against such persons, too. But my decisions have never reflected a judgment about the people before me. Only his best, only my best judgment about the law and the facts at issue in each particular case. And he said, the truth is, is that a judge who likes every outcome he reaches is probably a pretty bad judge. And to my mind, that strikes a chord because because I think the task of the judge, as I hope to explain in the course of this lecture, uh, is to 
um, be guided by the text and the legal materials and where possible to arrive at a neutral outcome based on the application of legal principles of interpretation and reasoning to those texts and arriving at a result. Now, um, I also recognise that judges, of course, are human and human psychology plays a key role in all of this. And in the course of my presentation, I hope to address a, a number and illustrate some of these difficulties by reference to a number of judicial dilemmas uh, where judges were faced with really difficult uh, issues and to what extent they should take the consequences into account. So we go to the next slide, please. Um, now, um, this is Mr. Justice Wendell Holmes um, of the U.S. Supreme Court and writing to Harold Lasky in, in um, 1914, he uttered these memorable lines. He said, if my fellow citizens want to go to hell, I will help them. It's my job. Um, so this is one of the most distinguished judges of the U.S. Supreme Court, indicating really that it wasn't his, if you take these words literally, that it wasn't his task, as it were, to look behind the legislation or to construe it in such ways to avoid a consequence that he didn't like. And I mean, he seemed to be quite indifferent to the result and said, well, look, if my fellow citizens want to go to help, to help I'll help them. It's my job. And um, he seemed to espouse a particular view of judicial neutrality. Now, if we go to the next slide. And I'd like to think that Lord McDermott would have approved because um, he found for the punter in Hill and William Hill in 1949 in holding that the money which the bookmaker sought to recover was an irrecoverable gaming debt, uh, even though in Lord Lowry's famous words um, uh, on an essay on Lord McDermott and the other Irish Lords of Appeal, he said this was Lord McDermott's closest ever contact uh, with the bookmaker. Um, so there's another example of that type of judicial neutrality, uh, applying the law and arriving at a result and being, in a sense, indifferent as to the consequences. Now, ne next, go to the next slide. Uh, but contrast this with the views of the former president of the um, Irish High Court in Dublin, uh, Mr. Justice Nicholas Kearns, in retirement speech in December uh, 2015. And he was quoted uh, by Orti is saying that judges should never put themselves in the position of realizing that a particular decision has opened a Pandora's box of unintended consequences, which, if proper consideration had been applied, might have led to a different approach being taken. And this is particularly the case where boundaries of judicial and executive function intersected. Um, uh, this is a rare and I think very valuable comment because um, it does suggest, perhaps expressly, albeit not in a judgment, of course, that judges should take or uh, consequences into account or perhaps have regard to consequences. And uh, th this is not a new idea because I suppose for over a hundred years, the realist school of jurisprudence led by Jerome Frank um, uh, uh, onwards has argued that this, in fact, is what judges do. That instead of the, that, the they argue that the classical theory of judging, that judges, as it were, neutrally uh, apply the, uh, take on a blindfold and apply the, the, the legal principles neutrally was a fallacy. And they said, in fact, what judges do is to arrive at what they think is the correct decision and then use legal principle to justify their reasoning. Um, but that is not, I think, um, well, that's understood by a lot of judges. You rarely find judges expressly advocating this. Now, let's go to the next slide. Um, um, now, I, I'm just going to take by way of an initial contrast um, the very famous dispute between Lord Denning in the Court of Appeal uh, and the, the House of Lords, uh, which I suppose the stuff of legend of the 1970s, but came to a head um, with Dupont, Steele and Sears in 1980. And this concerned the interpretation of trade union legislation, which was designed, um, some might think, to curb the um, excesses of uh, trade union influence and power at the time. Um, uh, others might think that uh, this was a retrograde interference with long-standing rights of um, uh, trade unionists. But in any event, um, uh, Lord Denning 
um, the, the, the legislation in question had been passed by um, a parliament in the 1970s. It recognised the right to strike um, uh, and restated it in a particular way. And um, Lord Denning had, I think, difficulties with this legislation and sought to construe it narrowly so that uh, the right to strike was not perhaps as, in particular in relation to secondary picketing, was not as extensive as um, perhaps the legislation seemed to allow. Um, in any event, in Dupont Steele and Sirs, the House of Lords and a judgment delivered by Lord Scarman gently chided Lord Denning uh, in his interpretation of the legislation, which uh, in a way which sought to restrict these uh, this right to strike. And the real point that I want to emphasize here is that what Lord Scarman said, he said, my basic criticism of all the three judgments in the Court of Appeal is that in their desire to do justice, the court failed to do justice in a uh, according to law. And he said, unpalatable statute law may not be disregarded or rejected merely because it is unpalatable. And then went on to say, um, and I think there's great wisdom in these lines, great judges are in their different way judicial activists, but the constitution separation of powers must be observed if judicial independence uh, is not to be put at risk. For if people in parliament come to think that the judicial power is to be confined by nothing other than the judge's sense of what's right, confidence in the judicial system will be replaced uh, by, uh, by fear of becoming uncertain uh, and arbitrary in its application. And I, I think that, as I said, there's great wisdom in what Scarman, Lord Scarman had to say in stressing that it's essentially the text of the law that counts and the judges should not seek to interpret legislation by reference to their own personal views. In other words, Lord Denning might have thought that with this trade union legislation that Parliament wanted to go to hell. Uh, but uh, Scarman was sort of saying is that even if you think that, rather like Holmes, it's your task to help them. That's your job. So if we go to the next slide, please. Um, so the fundamental questions that I want to pose here are to what extent can or should judges take the consequences of their decisions into account when arriving at decisions? So if they think that the result will be bad, should that factor influence them at all? And um, I also want to pose the question, what role does judicial psychology play? Because I think that um, psychology is a key part of judging uh, and possibly an underappreciated uh, and under discussed feature uh, of judging. And I want, before um, I, I address, if you like, the most fundamental question of all, to what extent should the consequences of a decision be taken into account, I want first to um, give a number of examples of judicial dilemmas where I think psychological factors come to, into play. So if we go to the first, the next slide, please. Um, here is a picture of Mr. Justice Adrian Hardman, um, uh, and who was a judge of the um, uh, Irish Supreme Court between 2000 and until his untimely death uh, in March 2016. But I, I recall um, Judge Hardman commencing a lecture um, in 2013 by telling the story of how, as a young junior counsel, he was asked to do an opinion in respect of a plaintiff who had suffered horrible and life-changing in injuries as a result of an industrial accident. And in that opinion, um, uh, Adrian recounted how he expressed considerable sympathy for the plight of the plaintiff, but argued that because he couldn't discern any negligence on the part of the employer, uh, he thought that the plaintiff had no case. Now, he showed what he thought was uh, an erudite uh, opinion to his more worldly wiles wise silk uh, who told him to put the opinion away because uh, in those days we had juries in the republic for personal injuries he said because no jury would reach that conclusion and the case was then ultimately settled by the employer's insurer and the road to uh, a decision of the supreme court to the Supreme Court in Dublin in, in O'Keefe in Hickey in December 2008 uh, started at that point. And it's a case I'm going to come back to uh, in the course of this lecture. So if we just go to the next slide. Now, I'm going to pose a number of, um, draw attention to a number of judicial dilemmas. 
And the first is that of Sir Charles O'Connor, who was the master of the rolls um, uh, in 1922. And um, after the provisional government had been formed uh, in Dublin in uh, January 1922, civil war started in, in June of 22. And at the height of the Civil War, um, O'Connor, as Master of the Rolls, presided over a habeas corpus application brought on behalf of Erskine Childers, who is a um, noted author, among other things, The Riddle of the Sands. Uh, and he had been secretary, indeed, to the treaty delegation uh, in uh, London in December 1921, but afterwards had repudiated the treaty and gone over to the side of the rebels. And uh, he had been sentenced to death by a military court for possession of a pistol uh, in breach of a resolution which had been approved by Doyle Aaron that September. Now, this was at the time only um, a unicameral Doyle, um, the, uh, the the full parliament, the Oireachtas of the Irish Free State uh, wasn't yet in being. Uh, that would only happen on the 6th of December 1922. Now, Childers' fundamental argument was that such a prohibition could only be imposed by act of parliament and not simply by resolution. Um, and if we just go to the next slide, um, uh, this was the dilemma which O'Connor faced, because after a four day, uh, you might recall it, just bear in mind, at this stage, the four courts had been destroyed in the course of the fighting. Uh, the courts had been uh, moved to various venues, one of which was in the Great Hall in King's Inns. And after a four day a hearing in December 22, uh, which was guarded by Free State troops, uh, um, O'Connor held that he had no jurisdiction because a state of war existed. And you can see that um, in his judgment, you know, this sort of anger coming out, he said, you know, he said, why am I sitting in this temporary makeshift? Because one of the noblest buildings in the country um, uh, has been destroyed as a mass of crumbling ruins, the work of revolutionaries who proclaim themselves soldiers of an Irish Republic. I know that the Public Records Office, a building which might have been spared even by the most extreme of irreconcilables, has been reduced to ashes, which can never be replaced. And if this is not a state of war, I would like to know what is. Now, um, uh, legal legend has it, and I think it's true that he delivered this judgment by candlelight at about eight o'clock on a Thursday evening after a four day hearing which had uh, commenced in King's Inns on the previous Monday. And um, obviously this was a, a high, very, very high stakes case because if Childers were to succeed, it would mean that a key part of the legal armory uh, of the free state or the provisional government strictly uh, at the time uh, would fall away. Uh, who knows what would have happened to the democratic institutions of the state which were fighting for survival at the time. And in any event, um, I mean, I certainly, I don't think any of us would like to have been in, in the dilemma that O'Connor uh, faced. In any event, O'Connor decided that there was a state of war. He couldn't entertain this point and he refused a stay on his refusal of habeas corpus. And even though the Court of Appeal uh, for Southern Ireland, as it then was, uh, was about to hear a similar case, an appeal in a similar case within a few days, um, uh, O'Connor refused uh, a stay. Uh, and it was a stay on execution, uh, and literally so, because uh, even though a notice of appeal was filed, because there was no stay, um, Childers was executed at dawn within hours of the delivery of the judgment while an appeal was pending. Now, as I say, that's a very difficult situation to find yourself in, uh, and uh, I personally wouldn't like to be too hard on, on Sir Charles. But it's interesting um, uh, is that uh, after the Free State was established and the new courts were set up, Sir Charles was appointed a judge of the first Supreme Court in June 1924, but he resigned suddenly the following April 1925. And his private papers reveal that both he and his wife suffered a sort of mental breakdown as a result of which they'd come to believe was his failure of nerve in the children's case. In other words, 
um, O'Connor reproached himself uh, and was overcome almost by mental anguish by the fact that he felt that at his moment of trial, he had arrived at the wrong decision, that he had allowed the consequences, in a sense, to overbear his judgment. Now, as I say, I don't think any of us really should be too hard uh, on the shade of Sir Charles. I mean, it was a very, very difficult case. But I just give it as an example of how psychological factors surely must influence um, the uh, the uh, judicial judgment, or can at least do so. Now, next, come to the next slide. Um, here's the dilemma of Oliver Wendell Holmes in the Abrams case in 1919, where immediately after the First World War, the US Supreme Court is confronted with the first wave of free speech cases. Uh, you have a kind of a motley group of communists and anarchists uh, who are demonstrating and agitating in support of Soviet Russia, which had just been established um, the, in, in two years previously. And um, the um, the the defendants in the Abrams case were convicted uh, of offences under the Espionage Act for urging support for Soviet R Russia. And Holmes pinned his famous dissent um, uh, championing the First Amendment and the right of free speech uh, when men have realised that the time has upset many fighting fates, that the ultimate good desired is better better reached by the free trade and idea, and that the best ideas and the best test of truth is the power of the thought to get itself accepted in the competition of the market. Um, and he said, that's the theory of the Constitution. So it's very uh, wonderful legal prose here. Um, but you just go to the next slide. But um, a few days before the opinion, the judgment was due to be delivered in December 1919, three of Holmes's colleagues, Justice McKenna, Pitney and Van de Vanter, appear on the doorsteps of um, his house in I Street in Washington. Here it is on the right hand side. Um, uh, and they urged him politely, but in no uncertain terms, not to go through with his planned descent, given Holmes's great reputation and his military record. It would do great harm, of which he was perhaps unaware. And um, even though his wife uh, said that she agreed with this de visiting delegation, uh, Holmes said he was not for turning and he was going to deliver this dissent. And as one of his biographers says, in the shadow of the Red Scare and the vehement disapproval of much of the legal pro profession and indeed much of the country, Holmes staked his reputation. Boston Brahmin, Civil War hero, legal scholar, distinguished judge to defend freedom of speech for communists, pacifists and foreign born anarchists. And as another commentator said, free speech in America was never the same after 1919. So there was a judge who stuck by his principles, uh, even though it must have been tempting uh, to go along with uh, what was urged by uh, his colleagues and indeed member, his own wife. Um, uh, but Holmes stuck to his principles uh, and delivered this very famous dissent. Now, go to the next slide, please. Now we have the dilemma of Lord Atkin in Liversidge and Anderson. Uh, this is well known, I think, to all of you, uh, the decision of the House of Lords from uh, November 1941. Did the government have to give reasons for the detention of the plaintiff uh, under the Regulation 18b internment powers? And the majority of the House of Lords says no, they didn't. But there was a celebrated and very famous dissent from uh, Lord Atkin. If we go to the next slide. Um, and you have Atkin dissented. He said, "If you know, he'll stand alone if needs be, saying that the arguments of the Attorney General could have been comfortably addressed to the judges of Charles the First." And then, in the famous passage, he he said, "I know of only one authority which can justify the suggested method of construction. When I use a word," said Humpty Dumpty, "it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor nor less." And then he concludes by saying, after this long discussion, the question is uh, whether the words if a man has can mean if a man thinks he has. I have opinion they cannot and the case should be decided accordingly. Now, thanks to the work of Robert Houston and others, uh, we know that um, Atkin was placed under acute pressure in respect of this. The Lord Chancellor, um, um, uh, Simon, who hadn't been sitting on the appeal, um, 
um, got a sneak preview of the uh, the uh, judgments from the House of Lords uh, clerk, and uh, he wrote to Atkin in firm but very polite terms, asking him could he remove the Humpty Dumpty jive before the judgment was delivered. And Atkin refused to do that. Um, uh, the judgment was delivered as it stood. Um, there was then um, uh, a letter from Viscount Maugham, who was uh, the lead uh, judge for the majority, uh, writing to the London Times saying that this, these comments about the Attorney General and his learned junior were unjustified. There was a, then a parliamentary debate and so on. But what I think is so interesting about, um, intriguing about Live Research and Anderson, over and above that, intriguing as it is, is the fact that what happened afterwards. And what happened afterwards was that Atkin was, effect, was effectively snubbed by his colleagues, many of whom refused to eat with him, uh, and many of whom indeed refused to speak with them. And I think there is evidence to suggest that, uh, although this is disputed by one of Atkins biographers, but it certainly wasn't a pleasant experience. And the collegiality, which is a feature of appellate judging, I think, was severely disturbed, to say the least. Um, and Atkin died maybe in some respects a broken man in June 1944. And he never again had the same sense of, I think, friendship and collegiality, which he had had with many of the law lords up to that point, especially his friend, Lord Wright. Uh, so um, I have to say, I think that not only is this a great ju judgment, but one has to admire Atkins' sense of a formidable sense of conviction, and he was prepared to do this and say this and resist pressure, even though he must have known that many um, friendships and collegiality of the law lords would be put to the test. Now, if we just go to the next slide, um, this is, um, uh, I'm taking the liberty of just referring to a great work of fiction, um, um, Cullum to Beans, The Heather Blazing. Uh, I think it's a great insight into uh, judicial psychology, and I'll come to that in a moment. And I, I suppose um, if you want to know what those rather strange people south of the border are really like, uh, I would urge you to uh, read this book. It's a great, it's a great book in so many ways. And just as an aside, um, we learn this: the fictional Mr. Justice Redmond um, is raised in a staunchly Fianna Fáil background from County Wexford. Uh, he he r rises through the ranks. Uh, he appears in many of the great constitutional cases of the 1960s. And then in the book, he meets uh, the then Minister of Finance, Charles Hawhey, uh, later Taoiseach, in a Dublin restaurant. And then this exchange happens. Um, Hawhey gave him a mock punch in the chest and grinned. You're for the bench, Hawhey said. Eamon said nothing, but held his stare. Will you take it if you're offered it, Hawhey asked. I will, Eamon said. I'll see you soon, Hawhey said. It's good to meet you. So... Uh, perhaps um, column to being playfully um, uh, with the judicial appointments from the 1960s. But the real, go to the next slide, please. The real point of the story is the dilemma of the fictional judge uh, Redmond in the Heather Blazing. Um, because in this case, uh, in this, um, Redmond is faced with uh, a case which presents the interpretation of Article 41 of the, the Republic's Constitution uh, concerning the definition of the family. And it was always understood as meaning um, uh, a married couple and their children, but did it extend to um, uh, somebody, a common law arrangement where um, a, a couple were living together and not married? And um, um, so in the book, uh, Tobin has Redmond posing this, what was what was a family and it was always understood in one way in 1937. He said it was his task not to look at what was meant in 1937, but what it might mean now and so on. But the key point for us is this, is that Redmond thinks about it for a while. And the consternation it would cause his colleagues, a definition of the concept of the family. The teacher would have to win the case then, and the nuns would have to lose. The idea suddenly seemed plausible, but would need a great deal of thought and research. 
Um, lawyers he knew knew that he was not the kind of judge who would entertain far-fetched notions in his court. If he were another kind of person, he could write that judgment. And I think that um, uh, with this, um, Tobin has shown great insight into uh, the into the judicial persona and some of the real dilemmas that judges encounter. Uh, and uh, unlike Atkin, and unlike Holmes, um, the fictional Judge Redmond um, decides that he won't entertain this possibility, partly because of what his colleagues might think and the consternation that would be caused. And again, I don't think we should be too hard on the fictional Judge Redmond because um, uh, the views of our colleagues are important in both life as well as law, and it is often peer pressure and peer comments which prevent us from saying and doing foolish things. And as I say, I think that's as true for a judge as it is uh, in ordinary life. But I think Tobin captures acutely that judicial dilemma. Now, if we go to the next slide. Now, um, we're now going to the next part of the lecture, because having posed some of these judicial dilemmas, I want to then raise the question is to what extent should we, uh, should judges take into account what we perceive as bad consequences or unwelcome consequences as part of our judicial reasoning? And as I say, that's a view that um, has been urged by, by realists for over 100 years. And um, you rarely find it expressed by judges, though. Um, and uh, I think um, I just want to draw attention to two very valuable and interesting contributions uh, of uh, Judge Richard Posner, um, now retired um, US uh, uh, Court of Appeal judge, one of the great jurists of recent times, and Mr. Justice Richard Humphreys uh, of the high, Irish High Court uh, in Dublin. And um, in 2017, Posner um, gave, on his retirement, uh, gave an interview to the New York Times where he said that really judges should pay very little attention to legal rules and ask instead what is a sensible solution to this legal dispute. And then um, the article in um, 2017, Mr. Justice Humphrey said that uh, he spoke about the approach uh, which sneers at what it calls result-oriented jurisprudence and classed to his bosom the concept of fiat justicia rua celum. Justice must swing her sword blindly and leave it to the little people uh, to pick up the pieces. Decisions that unleash particularly egregious consequences are sometimes accompanied by a disclaimer uh, that Judges are unfor unfortunately coerced by the law into a particular result if the law were some objective monolithic certainty. And um, Holmes, is, or, uh, Mr. Mr. Humphreys is quoting uh, Posner in part uh, in this. And then just go to the next slide, please. And then uh, Judge Humphreys continues by saying that legal rules are an implementation of a social contract and those called upon to interpret that social contract, principally the judiciary, must put front and centre um, that interpretive and adjudicative decisions have real world effects on real people. And a theory of adjudication that is negative, even disastrous and anar anarchic results in the real world is generally to be regarded as a failure. So here you have two very prominent judges, one in the United States and one in the Republic, arguing expressly um, um, that judges should do what the realists have always contended that they did do, which is that w judges should take legal consequences into account in arriving at their decision. Now, I am endeavouring within the confines of this lecture um, just to give a number, I'm going to take five examples as a thought experiment and see how this might work. Uh, and then I'll come uh, to uh, a tentative conclusion. So if we just come to the next slide, please. Um, the first case um, is a decision of the um, Supreme Court in Dublin in 1975, Moynihan and Moynihan. And this was a case where um, a little girl was scolded by a teapot um, 
when her aunt, who was pouring the tea, uh, was suddenly distracted and called uh, to the uh, phone. Uh, and I should have said that this this little um, uh, tea ceremony happened when the little girl and her parents were visiting their grandmother uh, and their aunt at their grandmother's house. Now, a majority of the Supreme Court held that the grandmother was vicariously liable for the actions of the aunt so that the little girl could successfully sue her grandmother in negligence and thereby, one supposes, uh, recover probably as against the grandmother's insurance policy. Um, and then, if we just go to the next slide, you have a dissent um, from um, Mr. Justice Henshi, and um, it's a you know long dissent. And I just want to emphasise one or two words. He said that um, if you just in the middle of the page, he said, "I know no justification for stretching the law so as to cover the present claim." And he said that to transfer or extend liability in these circumstances from the blameworthy person to a blameless person would involve the redress of one wrong by the creation of another, and it would be unfair and oppressive. So the point that Henshi made in his dissent was that you shouldn't distort the law in relation to vicarious liability precisely in order to um, get the consequences that you want. This is a sort of legal reasoning in reverse. And um, I'm sure I can speak for everybody that just as much as you all, um, I mean, I'm in favour of the compensation where possible um, of little girls who have been injured and scalded by uh, teapots. Um, but the real question is, is, is there an answer in law or is there a basis in law for providing that compensation? And this is, in a sense, variant of the dilemma of what Adrian Hardiman spoke about in that lecture, uh, where he was required as a young junior to give an opinion about the prospects of the, the worker who had been seriously injured, but where Adrian couldn't discern any negligence on the part of the employer. Um, and um, in O'Keefe and Hickey, go to the next slide, please, um, um, uh, which was a, a case concerning whether um, in the decision of the Irish Supreme Court in 2008, whether or not um, uh, the Irish state was liable for um, child sexual abuse per uh, perpetrated by a school teacher. Um, a majority 4 1 said no, there was no vicarious liability. That's an interesting question in itself. But what, what's interesting for this purpose is, is what Adrian Hardiman said about Moynihan and Moynihan. Uh, and he said that. Um, it is almost inconceivable that an infant plaintiff suing by her father would sue the father's mother, the infant's grandmother, if it were anticipated that that lady, a widow, would have to pay the damages herself. It seems inescapable that the action was taken in the hope of accessing an insurance policy, perhaps the grandmother's household insurance. But in any event, he went on to say that the, in, the majority in Moynihan had engaged in a control... I think a contrived and legalistic analysis uh, of the legal relationship between the aunt and the grandmother and the little girl in order to ensure that the grandmother, the granddaughter could succeed. And Adrian saw that as a, a wrong application of the law. And if you go to, go to the next slide uh, and uh, hear more criticism from Judge Hardiman of Moynihan. But where he says is that uh, in all cases, there was a serious injury to a human person. There's a, a human, an innocent person. There's a human tendency to wish that that person should be compensated. But the social and economic consequences of providing a law so flexible that it can be used to provide compensation in the absence of liability is addressed in the judgment of Henshi J. So in other words, what Judge Hardiman was saying is we can't distort the law in order to arrive at the consequences that we want to achieve, even if uh, you have, in a sense, a deserving infant plaintiff. Now, let's come, that's the first example. Now, if we come to the second example, um, is um, um, the case brought by John Hume, Ivan Cooper and others against the Derry, London Derry Justices in 1972. And uh, that was a case where 
the uh, Civil Authority Special Powers Act had conferred a power of arrest uh, on uh, the uh, army um, uh, in certain circumstances. And um, John, the late John Hume um, was convicted of um, an offence uh, uh, under this section. Uh, and the, but in 1972, the Queen's Bench Division, led by, presided over by Lord Larry, Lord Chief Justice, um, uh, held that this was, these powers were ultra vires the Government of Ireland Act uh, 1920, uh, because the 1920 Act had stipulated that the Northern Irish Parliament could not legislate uh, in relation to um, the army or in relation to military matters. Now, um, for me, this is a straightforward and orthodox application uh, of the rule of law, that the Westminster had never intended that the Northern Ireland Parliament would have this jurisdiction to legislate in relation to the military. They purported to do that. And uh, it seems to me that the uh, Queen's Bench Division was absolutely correct in arriving at the result that it did. But I pose the question is, um, to what extent, if one adopts the, if like Posner, what I might term uh, respectfully, the Posner-Humphreys analysis, um, should they have taken the consequences into account? Because whatever your views uh, about the difficult situation which prevailed in Northern Ireland in the early 1970s, nobody, I think, could say that the army uh, could be abolished at the stroke, of, could or should be abolished at the stroke of a pen. So the Queen's Bench Division, in arriving at their conclusion, was surely, of course, was consequent, uh, conscious of the consequences of this decision, uh, and it would have consequences that would have to be, uh, would, would have to be addressed by Parliament. And indeed, legislation was enacted within hours of this decision. So, um, I respectfully disagree with Judge Posner insofar as he says that the argument that um, judges are coerced by the law amounts to power without responsibility. And I would give this case as an example of, of where it's the reverse. Um, judges, that court was, to my mind, coerced by the law, if words are to have any meaning. And it wasn't an abdication of power or the exercise of power without responsibility. It was rather the proper exercise of the judicial role and uh, to find that the law was ultra virus, the Government of Ireland Act. And I suppose Judge Humphreys just if we go back for a moment, <clears throat> Judge Humphreys might say that uh, this is an example of a judgment with downstream consequences um, uh, of which the Olympian judges are generally unconcerned. Well, I, I think that that is just the application of the rule of law. Uh, but I think the, the posner Humphreys argument does um, oblige us to ask, um, in relation to this and perhaps other cases, um, should the Queen's Bench Division have taken the consequences into account? How could they have done that? Done that? Should they have? And if you say, for example, you know, judges should apply some sort of social contract theory, how would the judges have been able to answer what was the proper result? Because um, in a democracy, um, people might have a whole range of views as to what the powers of the army and aid of the civil power should be in this situation. Should it be a very minimal role to one which, as Parliament ultimately adopted, one which essentially bestows all necessary powers on the military or somewhere in between? And uh, the difficulty that I have with respect to the posner Humphreys argument is, is that judges are not elected and really can't make policy choices of this kind. Now, if we next go to the next slide, another example, or Justice Coughlin here on the um, uh, left hand side, this case of Bohill and the police service of Northern Ireland, and where Lord Justice Coughlin held that a fair employment tribunal couldn't entertain a claim of discrimination brought by a retired policeman who was an agency worker, um, but who wasn't an employee as, de as defined. Now, that meant, unfortunately for Mr. Vohul, that his claim on the merits couldn't be entertained. And again, it seems to me with great respect that um, the decision of the Court of Appeal is 
absolutely correct. It was um, a, a perfectly correct application of legal principles. And um, even if you might think, as if I may respectfully say so, I do, that the Fair Employment Order was itself in need of amendment. But uh, again, I think that that is ultimately a legislative judgment and not a judicial decision. And I, for my part, I think it would have been wrong with respect that the Court of Appeal should have ever entertained the argument that they should in some way distort the meaning of the word uh, 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 employee as defined by the Fair Employment Order in order to mitigate consequences, which, <clears throat> if you ask me, were objectively unfair. Now, again, just doing this thought experiment, we might just ask ourselves, um, should Lord Justice Coughlin have applied the Posner analysis and pay very little attention to legal rules and ask what is a sensible resolution to this legal dispute? Well, if you take Judge Posner at his word, um, then it would seem to me that uh, the sensible resolution to this legal dispute is to say that um, uh, some contrived or artificial or judicially supplemented interpretation of the word employee should have been given so that Mr. Bohol um, claim could have been entertained on the merits. But I would contend that that is um, that's where the difficulties arise, because Judges in that respect have to be neutral. They're not elected. And the resolution of what the judgment as to what is an unfair law is ultimately won in a democracy for um, what Holmes described as the articulate voice of the sovereign. In the UK context, it's that of Parliament, and in Northern Irish context, is supplemented by the Northern Ireland Assembly. Uh, uh, and again, um, while if you oppose the poser analysis, you say, yes, it's only fair that, judge, uh, that Mr. Bohol's claim should be heard on the merits, but that isn't what the law for good or for ill actually provided. If we go to the next slide, please. Now, um, <clears throat> Concha is going to try and finish in the next 10 minutes. Um, the, this is a case of O'Neill and the Minister for Agriculture and, um, uh, from the Republic, where a non-statutory administrative scheme was established by the department, which provided for one license for the provision of artificial insemination for bovines per regional geographic area. Now, um, in O'Neill, um, it was held um, that this a scheme was ultra vires legislation, which had been enacted by uh, the Oireachtas in Dublin in 1947. It had made no reference to this geographical uh, regional monopolies, and the Supreme Court held that it was ultra vires. Now, in his judgment, Mr. Justice um, Keane ex um, expresses regret at this conclusion, uh, saying the scheme had worked well. Now. Um, and he thinks it's, un, it's a bit unfortunate that the court is finding that the scheme is, is ultra virus. Now, I would suggest that you one could debate, if you're an economist, uh, you could debate the merits of having regional monopolies of this kind. Some might say it helps uh, picking winners um, uh, and that those who are the holders of the license, two of them indeed have gone on to become multinationals, Kerry Group and uh, and Glombia. Um, other economists might say, mm, uh, we think that regional monopolies of this kind are actually very bad for consumer choice and unfair to uh, uh, <clears throat> to new entrants and distort the competitive process. So I think there's different views on this, but I ask myself, <clears throat> could the Irish Supreme Court have said something like this? Um, we think that this system of exclusive licenses has worked just fine. And because we don't want to create chaos in the agricultural sector, we will find some adventitious legal principle which will enable us to uphold the virus of the scheme. Now, I think if they had said something like that, which is what the realists would contend they often do, or judges often do, and, uh, and perhaps even should do, um, I think that many eyebrows would be raised in many quarters on the basis that legal reasoning was being distorted by the selective personal preferences of unelected judges. And I suppose that's where I come in, in the sense that I find myself closely or attached to the to the idea of textualism in the sense that, again, it is the text of the legislation or the body of case law, which um, I think, well, there's obviously choices available to judges. Uh, nobody disputes that. But that um, because we're not elected, 
precisely because we're not elected, um, that uh, judges um, should should just sit, ad adhere where they can to that text and to arrive at the result. So, in a sense, I have a certain sympathy for what Holmes says that if people want to go, if the people want to go to hell, um, I will help them because it's my job. Now, then, come to the final example. Next slide, please. Um, Robinson and the Northern Ireland Secretary um, was the election of David Trimble in, uh, as First Minister in November 2001 valid, even though it was after a, a six week period specified in the Northern Ireland Act. Um, I mean, this is a very difficult case. And uh, it's interesting that the majority in the House of Lords um, uh, sought expressly to address the argument which had been vigorously uh, urged on them by counsel uh, for uh, Peter Robinson that they should apply the law and not arrive at an expedient political decision. And Lord Hoffman, as a judge of the majority, follows the famous article of Herbert Vexler in the 1959 Harvard Law Review, uh, where, where he had argued that judicial decisions must must rest on reasons that in their generality uh, and in their neutrality transcend any immediate result that is involved. Now, in the end, uh, the majority of the House of Lords said that the six week period didn't mean uh, that uh, anything that happened after that was necessarily void or ultra vires, um, <clears throat> and they sought to give a generous interpretation to what they contended was the objectives of the legislation. Uh, I think probably for me to get involved in this. Um, but I, I think that one can understand the perspective. Uh, it's a, and, but they're also very um, closely argued dissents. But there's another example of the sort of dilemmas that judges do face um, uh, with legislation where um, the, uh, the question is, should judges be tempted um, by having regard to the consequences of their decision if they're going to arrive at, at consequences that they think are unfortunate or uh, undesirable. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I come in conclusion uh, uh, to my parting thoughts on this. Um, um, I, I suppose um, if you were applying, if, if law was a pure science, which it isn't, um, uh, then the scientific method would say we must apl always apply the law uh, as you understand it to be, irrespective of the consequences, even if you think that these consequences uh, are unfortunate or even baneful. Um, as we know from Holmes's The Common Law, at least, uh, that um, law isn't a pure science. It isn't a question of mathematical axioms. And it's not pure logic, it's experience. But it's also, I think, not even experience, it's also judicial psychology. Um, uh, and so judging is as much an art and reflects these psychological features and these judicial dilemmas of which I have but lightly spoken within the confines of this of this lecture. But I think the scientific method nonetheless as applied to law has valuable lessons because uh, it aids neutrality and impartiality on the part of the judge. And it enables, I think, um, more public confidence in saying that the judge is neutrally applying the law and is independent of his or uh, her own personal thoughts and beliefs, uh, either regarding the parties or as to what the law should be. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I close on these thoughts. I said that a uh, human psychology runs deep and judges are often uh, affected deeply by the facts and circumstances of hard cases with real life consequences. And I think the shades of Charles O'Connor and Lord Atkin uh, uh, would tell us as much. The desire to please, to be collegiate, to be flexible uh, are features of that psychology. And it allows us judges to leave in a certain strict and unforgiving legal logic with a necessary degree of pragmatism and indeed common sense. And so, ladies and gentlemen, to that extent, judges cannot be entirely neutral in the sense of affecting a complete Olympian detachment uh, from the real life consequences of their decisions. Yet I suggest 
and our own little thought experiment, I hope, uh, with a very small sample of cases, has shown that judges are at their best when they act independently of their own personal subjective views and when they listen only to the authentic voice of the legal sovereign. If psychology and pragmatism means that judges cannot always be neutral, then they should nonetheless strive to be so. And I cannot help but thinking that I would think that the shade of Lord McDermott would agree. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a great privilege, a great honour, and thank you for your perseverance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Justice Hogan, for that wonderful presentation. I think you've given us all a lot of food for thought there. While everyone is reflecting on the questions that you will like to ask in due course, we have been fortunate enough to be joined by the Lord Chief Justice for Northern Ireland, uh, Sir Declan Morgan, and by my esteemed colleague here from the Law School, Professor Bryce Dixon, who are each going to share their responses with us on Judge Hogan's lecture. So, Sir Morgan, um, can we turn to you first, please, to share your thoughts with us? Yes, um, I'm absolutely delighted to do so. Um, Jared, that was a, an absolutely masterful uh, lecture, very thought provoking uh, and also very enjoyable, if I may say so, uh, with some uh, entertaining examples of the dilemmas uh, that judges face. Um, for my own part, I, I, I uh, spent some time um, thinking through just what neutrality meant in the uh, context in which we're looking at it, and, and to some extent um, uh, wondered about what it didn't mean as well. Um, uh, in terms of neutrality and the application of the law, of course, the sources of the law include in the Republic of Ireland, the Constitution, as in many other uh, jurisdictions. In all our jurisdictions, the statute and regulations and rules that uh, may be put in place. But also uh, for us, in a way, uh, in these islands, the common law, um, which, of course, is judge made um, and which involves um, legal policies. Uh, both being uh, established and then developed. Uh, and I think, therefore, that neutrality doesn't actually um, uh, mean that there is uh, any kind of prohibition upon uh, the development of that legal policy. In fact, that legal policy is critical uh, in filling in the gaps, as it were, um, that are left by the other sources of law uh, in our jurisdictions. And distributive justice is an obvious example of that. And the second thing that occurred to me is that um, uh, when one's looking at the um, uh, the legal base in statute, um, that it's clear that there are a number of different uh, approaches that can be taken to uh, statutory interpretation in that in some instances, the teleological or purpose of approach is considered appropriate. In others, a more grammatical approach um, is uh, appropriate. Um, in fact, Lord Stain, as we know, even went so far as to say in law context is everything. And I've often uh, thought that it really should be in law context is something rather than necessarily uh, establishing um, uh, entirely the position. But what that leads to is a recognition that neutrality doesn't require uniformity. In other words, um, that neutrality uh, can result in um, differing uh, opinions. Um, and the third thing I wondered about was uh, applying these principles in uh, the um, the uh, context of the Human Rights Act, which is where we are in this jurisdiction, not having had a uh, constitutional background such as um, that which uh, your jurisdiction has had and not having had, for instance, um, the exciting developments of uh, um, uh, that occurred in your Supreme Court during the 60s and 70s through um, that uh, extremely active uh, um, uh, court. Um, here, um, when the Human Rights Act was introduced, uh, the initial p legal policy developed by uh, Lord Bingham in Allah was that really one was looking to see whether or not um, uh, the uh, act that one was looking at was um, uh, contrary to the convention in the sense that it was, if it was within the margin of appreciation, then um, uh, it was unlikely that the court uh, would intervene. And that broadly remained the approach, I think, until 
uh, an adoption case from this jurisdiction called REP in 2009, um, where Lord Hoffman really gave the lead judgment and declared that um, the margin of appreciation was actually shared between the judges and, and, the, uh, uh, and the legislature, um, and that it was for the legislature in in each case of the judges in each case to decide uh, to what extent um, they should grasp it, as it were. And of course, that developed further with uh, Nick Nicholson, uh, the um, uh, right to assisted suicide case, where again, uh, all of the judges uh, recognized that um, the issue was uh, within the margin of appreciation and therefore was open to the judges. And again, in the Human Rights Act case, where um, the uh, um, where the, the termination of a pregnancy case where um, the judges took the view that the balance of these um, uh, on the face of a fairly moral issues were to be determined um, by the courts. And I think that has caused a difficulty for um, uh, judges because there are such strong views on either side. If one looks at the human rights case, one sees that there were four dissents um, in that case, uh, which uh, contended that uh, this wasn't an appropriate matter for um, the courts to decide. And it occurs to me that perhaps um, the approach that one should take in these types of situations is to uh, where one's looking at something of that kind, that one really has to ask oneself whether uh, the decision making process that one is going through is necessarily independent of one's own views. And it may be that that is the hallmark uh, of whether um, the uh, issue is one that is suitable for determination by uh, the judge and one that is uh, actually for the judge to set a step aside and leave to the determination of the uh, democratic uh, legislature. I mean, I don't know whether, uh, uh, I'm not saying that any of these thoughts are um, necessarily uh, thought through in any uh, deep and meaningful way, but for me, I think your lecture, as with any really good lecture, uh, has provoked uh, a degree of uh, questioning in my part, w which I would hope um, that I'll uh, pursue further uh, with other contributions uh, once I hear what they have to say. But thank you very much uh, for what has been a real masterpiece. Thank you very much, uh, Sir Morgan, for sharing some fascinating thoughts there. Um, Professor Dixon, uh, can we hear from you now, please? Um, sure, Louise. Jared, hello, and uh, I, I really enjoyed your your lecture. It was really stimulating and and thought provoking, as as the Chief Justice said. Thank you also for your kind comments on my book uh, on the Supreme Court. I, I'm I'm reassured that um, indeed it's a a work of non-fiction. That that's that's comforting. Um, I agreed very largely with the thesis of your lecture. Insofar as I, I too am a, a, a textualist, I think I focus. I like to think that it's important to focus on the the text uh, first and foremost. Um, I'm not so sure that I would go so far as to reject consequentialism totally. Um, I wouldn't sign up to the the the, the Posner Humphreys version of it as as you describe it, in that I don't think. Judges should make up their minds in advance uh, of uh, of hearing the case what the result should be, and then reason back from that, as as you as you Im imply, is the Posner Humphreys approach. Um, but I do think that judges, when taking decisions, should be aware of the consequences of the various options that are open to them when they're when they're thinking about how to decide the case, and if they can arrive at a decision uh, which has as it were, satisfactory consequences, and when we can argue what that 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 means, uh, then I, I think that should play a part in which of the options in front of them they they choose. Um, I also think that one must bear in mind the 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 oath that judges take. You you and the, the chief, of course, know this in your in your day to day lives. But 
it strikes me that whereas in Ireland, the, the, the Republic of Ireland, the lodestone is clearly the constitution and you must at all costs abide by the constitution. It seems to be that in the UK system, the lodestone is the doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty, which is still very much alive and kicking. And that um, places even more pressure on the judges, I think, to adhere first and foremost to what parliament has said or what parliament might still say on a topic rather than for the, the judges to, to trespass into that kind of territory. Um, I mean, you talked about the Robinson case there uh, as your last example. And uh, you rightly say it was a very um, difficult case, controversial case, uh, three to two, with one of the dissenters being uh, Lord Hutton, the, the former Lord Chief Justice of Northern Ireland. Um, I think if I'd been sitting in that case, I might have gone with the minority view because the text was pretty clear. It said that the, 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 these elections have to happen within six weeks. Um, the Good Friday Agreement didn't, didn't mention um, uh, any, any time limit. Parliament put a time limit in there in the Northern Ireland Act. And then for judges to come along, even Lord Bingham, another of my judicial heroes, but even Lord Bingham comes along and says, well, you know, six weeks doesn't really mean six weeks. We can ignore that. Um, I, I thought that was that was going too far, frankly. I would have I would have stayed with the minority. That might have meant because by the by the time the Lords decided the case, the Assembly had been sitting for six months or so. That might have meant uh, the Parliament needing to step in with retrospective legislation to to validate the running of the Assembly up until that point. But that's what you said happened rightly back in 1972 in the Hume case. They they passed legislation that didn't just change the law for the future. It said that as from 1921, the law had always been that the, the soldiers had had power to, 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 to disperse a crowd, etc. So, you know, Parliament can ultimately solve these problems. Uh, it may be the role of judges to point Parliament in the direction of a solution, but not themselves to take that solution. And my fi final comment, Jared, it picks up on what the chief was saying there, that I think the Human Rights Act has made a huge difference in, in the UK, more so when I, when I look at how the European Convention on Human Rights Act in the South, the, the, the Republic, has, has been applied by the judges there. It, it's it's clear that the Human Rights Act has had a much, much more significant influence on the the the, 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 jurisprudence, the common law of, of the UK than it has on the common law of Ireland. Um, and I, I wonder what you think about um, the prospect of judges and, and your You'll, you'll soon be taking up your your seat on the on the Supreme Court. Congratulations on that, by the way. Um, is there a prospect of the Irish Supreme Court becoming a little bit more sympathetic towards the protection of socioeconomic rights than it has traditionally been? Um, uh, I mean, I think even the UK Supreme Court has has uh, out, outdone the Irish Supreme Court in in that sphere, and, and I hope there's more to come from both courts. Um, and I also wanted, if there's time, for you to say what you thought about the uh, the Miller decision, the second Miller case, where the 11 judges of the Supreme Court in London held that um, Boris Johnson had exceeded his powers in proroguing Parliament. And uh, if you have time, the, the Adams judgment, one of Lord Kerr's last judgments in the Adams case mm -hmm. on the Carltona principle, I mean, that really was a courageous decision. Uh, he, he, he threw a, a spanner in the works of of the of the government by saying you can't ministers can't do things unless they've got um, very specific powers given to them to do them and they can't delegate powers unless they've been expressly authorised to do so. That's gone down quite badly, as you as you probably know, in in Whitehall. Um, but but life has gone on and Parliament, if it, if it wishes, can can uh, amend the law or or start insisting that the drafting of the law is more clear in, in many instances. So those are a few random thoughts, Jared. but I very, very much enjoyed your talk and thank you for it. Thank you very much, Bryce, for those the thoughtful comments. Uh, Judge Hogan, would you like to respond at this stage or should we turn to the question and answers in the audience? Um, <clears throat> or, or I just very quickly, um, um, some of... The very interesting comments from the Lord Chief Justice and from from Bryce. Um, uh, I, I don't get into any more trouble than I am in already. Um, 
let me just take the Adams case. Uh, I think that that was a very impressive application of judicial neutrality uh, by Lord Kerr um, uh, and a very rigorous application of the Carltona principle. Um, and I suppose that's the answer is what um, judges should do. And I don't really think that there is a great deal of difference between myself and the Lord Chief Justice and Bryce on all of these questions. Um, uh, and I think Bryce put it well by saying that consequentialism possibly has a role where the judge should certainly be consequence, should be uh, cognizant of the consequences of the decision. And uh, perhaps if two options are open, one is dramatic and one is less dramatic, that where possible, but only where possible, the judge might opt for the uh, least uh, disruptive one. But um, uh, I don't have the answers to this. And uh, it's really my paper is, is prompted by these judicial dilemmas and indeed prompted by what Judge Posner and Judge Humphreys have had to say. But I thank the Lord Chief Justice and uh, Professor Dixon for their very kind comments.